We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May his soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you this morning on another beautiful Lord's Day morning. I want to welcome everyone to the West Olive Church of Christ as we have gathered together either in person here this morning or via the live stream. And we just pray that everyone who is observing and worshiping with us this morning will be richly blessed by being here. Of course, we are still obliged to seek the government guidelines, and we ask everyone to practice the social distancing and, and so on and so forth. hate to say that. Long for the day when we can pull off those green and red pieces of tape all over this place and can just uh, sit where we want to sit, with whom we want to sit, as close as we want to sit, and just be close to Lord God. How we, how we long for those days. This morning we're going to do a lesson in the sermon time about God, what we can learn from nature about the God of nature. And then tonight, actually, beginning another series on the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. Tonight, we're going to look at Blessed Are the Poor in Spirit. Hope that you can be with us either in person again this evening or at least on the live stream. Here's a passage from the 18th Psalm, verse 46. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Let's pray. Father, we are assembled here and we bow before you with gratitude that we can be in your presence this morning. We pray your blessings on those who have been able to assemble here in this room and those who are worshiping with us in many, many places across the land. We pray your blessings to be with each one, Father. Help us, guide us, direct us as we worship that we might be made stronger and that your name, Father, might be made honored and glorified above all things. In Jesus we pray, amen. Eric. Our first song will be number 157. 157. Sing all four stanzas. For the
be number 226. 226. If you're able, will you stand as we sing this song? Sing all four stands. 226. Oh, Lord, my God, when I Let us pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for allowing us to, with humble hearts and humble minds this morning to come before your holy throne, Father. And it's through your Son that we have this relationship that we can come to you in prayer. And Father, we thank you for that. Father, we do look forward to the time that we can come home and be with you and your Son. We thank you so much for the debt he came on this earth to pay for us, Father. 
Father, as your children, we owe to be like thee, to walk in the path that you have set before us, Father. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we would see that and focus on that path, Father, that you have set before us. Oh, we thank you so much for sending your son to teach us those and that we walk in that path that he set. And follow its humility and it's by your grace that we're here today. Father, we ask you to just be with us this morning. Help us raise our voice in singing. And Father, that we'd open our ears and our hearts to the lesson this morning. And Father, that you would guide our focus. Father, we ask you to be with those that are unable to be with us this morning for one reason or another. To be with each and every one, Father, to guide and guard and direct them, whether it be an illness or traveling, and just able to be with us. Father, we ask you to be with everyone in this building and everyone that's online and listening and learning also, Father. Father, we ask you to be with our country. But Father, we ask you to give us understanding of what's going on in our world right now, not just here in our country, but the world around us. That, Father, that we would give us better understanding of what's going on and that those people in the leadership that are making decisions, that they be God-fearing people, though, Father, that you would be in their lives, that they would seek you out, Father, and have that conversation with you, Father, and have that prayer with you, Father, and that you would guide their hearts and their minds to follow the path that you have set for us. Father, be with us the rest of the service this morning. Guide and guard and direct us our efforts, and Father, may it be pleasing to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. Our next song will be number 669. 669. This is our time. Five hundred twenty-nine will be our song of encouragement after Brother Ray's lesson this morning. Five hundred twenty-nine. Then you, once you have that marked, if you'd like to turn to number one hundred eighty, that'll be our song before our scripture reading this morning. One hundred eighty.
Good morning. Our scripture reading will be taken from Psalm, the chapter 145, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness, and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. A kindergarten teacher one time told her students to draw a picture of what was important to them. And so they each, in their little desks, sat and began to draw pictures. In the back of the room, uh, Johnny was laboring over his drawing. It, as the few moments went by, pretty well everyone was done. They started to hand in their pictures of mommy or daddy or their favorite dog or something of that nature, but Johnny was still back in the back, drawing away. The teacher graciously walked back to him and put her arm around her shoulder, and she said, uh, Johnny, what are you drawing? He didn't look up. He just kept drawing away and working feverishly on his picture. And finally, he said, I'm drawing God, a picture of God. And she said, Johnny, we really don't know what God looks like. And Johnny said, well, they will when I finish my picture. <laughs> what is God like? What does God look like? There's actually two great sources available to us about God, what he is like, what is his nature. The first of these sources is obviously the Bible the Holy Word of God, the sacred scriptures. The Bible gives us specific information about him. It tells us about his creative work, the days of creation. It tells us of our beginnings, where we come from. It describes God's dealings with man, going through the Old Testament, the old law, how God dealt with people back in the very beginning. The Bible reveals a great deal about the personality of God. What does God like? What does God not like? How does God think? How does God feel? The Bible talks about his great love, his hatred for sin. And it gives his laws to be kept, teaching us what it is that we can do to be acceptable to God and those things which God does not approve of in our lives. The Bible gives us his wonderful promises, but also his great warnings. So the Bible is a very important, significant uh, picture that gives us what we know about God specifically. But nature is the second revealer of God. We look at nature and we can see so much about God. We can see, for example, in looking at nature that God exists, that, that there is a God, that he is real. There's a wonderful statement in the book of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, an obvious statement, every house is built by someone. Now, I've used that passage a number of times because it is so obvious. And who would deny it? Who on earth would drive down any street and say, well, most of these houses were built by men, but this one just happened. Uh, it was never built by men. Of course, no one would ever say that. But that's the first part of the passage. Every house is built by someone. And the second part of the passage says, but he that built all things is God. If we could not deny that every house was built by somebody, some carpenter, some contractor, someone, how could we look at God's universe and say, nah, nobody built that. Nobody designed that. That just happened. No, it, it didn't just happen. T. Moore wrote, there's nothing bright above below from flowers that bloom to stars that glow. But in its light, my soul can see some feature 
of your deity. God clearly speaks to us through the things that he has made. Romans chapter 1, we looked at this passage several weeks ago, verses 18 and 20. As Paul writes about those who don't believe in God as being without excuse, because he says the things about the existence of God are clearly seen in the things which he has created. We look at the creation and we realize that someone had to actually create it. In the book of Job, there's a marvelous statement. Job, as you know, is contending with his friends back and forth. And uh, Job makes a wonderful statement in chapter 12, rather chiding his friends. And in this case, obviously about God and who God is and the existence of God. He says in verses 7 through 10 of Job 12, But now ask the beasts and let them tell you, and the birds of the heavens and, and let them tell you, or speak to the earth and let it teach you, and let the fish of the sea declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Job just says, look at the earth, look at the creatures that have been created by God. Psalm 19 begins with verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. But what does nature teach us about God? What does nature teach us about the nature of God as to what kind of God he is? Well, I'm going to suggest that there's at least four great lessons that nature teaches us about God, about the very nature of God himself. As Paul suggested there in Romans chapter 1, and as Job declared in chapter 12, and as we saw in other passages, first of all, nature teaches us that God is a God of beauty. You look at the world around you, you look at the creatures that have been created, and it cannot escape your attention that God is truly a God of beauty. The wise man Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 said, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And as we look around, we can see how true that is. Over in the book of uh, Psalms chapter 50, the first couple of verses, he talks about the perfection of beauty. What a wonderful thought. Psalm 27, verse 4, the writer says, One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. Think about God being a God of beauty in the world that you look around and see. Think, for example, just about the beauty of flowers. How many myriads of different kinds of flowers are there in this world? Some wild, some developed through crossbreeding and so forth, but think of the colors, think of the designs, think of the shapes, think of the sizes, think of the fragrances. If one just took the flowers of the field, and no wonder Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. What a great evidence of the existence of God to simply look at a flower. Think about the birds and the songs of the birds, the different colors the different sounds that these creatures make. Think about the majestic scenery that we have around us, the beauty in our own state, for example, but not just our state, of course, across the globe, the various different kinds of beauty, beauties of deserts, beauties of forests, beauties of tundras, beauties of the polar caps. Everywhere we look around, there are things that are beautiful to see and wonderful to consider. Think of the glories of the heavens at night. How wonderful it is. Not so much here because of the light pollution that we have. But if you've ever had an opportunity, and I'm sure most of us have, to be out somewhere in the forest or in some place uh, where you're away from all the traffic lights and the street lights and the headlights and so on and so forth, it is quite a wonder indeed. 
When my daughter and her family used to live way up in northern Ontario, that was one of the things that I enjoyed beyond visiting them, was to, in the evenings at night, to go out at night and see the movement of the polar scenes, the, the, the beauties of the stars, the myriads. We look up and see 10 or 15 stars and think it's a clear night. In a place like that, as you've probably experienced, you can't count the stars. It's almost like one big light. There's just so many of them. The beauty of God. The beautiful things that God has created in this universe. And of course, where I come from, one of the beautiful things of God are the delicate snowflakes. How many of you have ever had a chance to actually look at a snowflake? Please don't raise your hand. They're magnificent. I read some time ago, and I don't know who ever decided this, but no two snowflakes are ever exactly alike. That's a pretty bold statement, if you ask me, when you consider how many quadrillions of snowflakes there might be in just a single storm, never mind that the north half of this world and the south half of this world is continuously covered by snow. But be that as it may, if you've ever had an opportunity to, to look at just snowflakes up close, perhaps on a piece of black cloth or something like that, the shape, the design, the intricacy of each one is just incredible. God is a God of beauty. Nature teaches that to us very plainly. But not only is God a God of beauty, nature also tells us that he is a God of order. In Psalm 104, verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works in wisdom you have made them all. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth and by understanding he has established the heavens. We talked about looking at the stars. It seems almost confusing, like there's no pattern to it or anything. But indeed, the wonders of the universe are astounding, to say the very least. Years ago, a writer by the name of Leipzig said, the overpoweringly strong proofs of intelligent and benevolent design lie all around us. We've all heard of Isaac Newton, the scientist of a few generations ago. He said this admirably beautiful structure of sun, planets, and comets could not have originated except in the wisdom and the sovereignty of an intelligent and powerful being. God is a God of order. The steadfastness of the laws of nature. Every now and then, more than likely, your computer needs to be rebooted. Suppose the laws of gravity had to be rebooted every now and then. Suppose suddenly just the law of gravity went on the fritz. What would it be like? We can't even imagine because we wouldn't live that long to even appreciate what's going on around us. But no, the laws of gravity never have to be rebooted. The, the laws of the seasons, the coming of the seasons, the night following the day, none of that ever has to be redone. In Psalm 119 and verse 90, the writer said, You establish the earth and it abides. God is a God of order. It runs like your computer except it's far more complex and far more accurate.
just keeps going. The immensity of it, the power of it. We see the power of the wind. We see the power of the sun's rays and of lightning. We don't see that much lightning around here, but ever thought about lightning? There was a picture on the news uh, just last night I was watching of lightning in New York City. Some photographer was there with magnificent cameras. The pictures were absolutely stunning if you happen to see it. But it hits, it flashes, and it's gone. Over with, done, right? No. Think about this. At any, think about this. At any given moment, about 2,000 thunderstorms are raging somewhere on the earth. We don't get that many here. But think about that. Somewhere on this planet at any given moment, let's just say for the sake of numbers right now, somewhere on the earth there are 2,000 thunderstorms that are rolling and flashing and thundering. All right, let's assume that. In those 2,000 thunderstorms, scientists tell us that lightning hits the earth about 100 times every second. Somewhere on the earth, 100 times every second, lightning hits on the earth. Now, here's the key. A single flash of lightning may have as much as 100 million volts of electricity. Had to keep your lamps going a while. A hundred million. And what's the benefit of this? What does this accomplish? It accomplishes a great deal. Because every year, scientists estimate 100 million tons of nitrogen come to the earth through lightning. A hundred million tons. Nitrogen is fertilizer. What keeps us green? Think about the power of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, He is upholding the universe by the word of his power. Number four, nature also tells us that God is a God of goodness that goodness is his nature. Acts chapter 17 and verse 25, he gives to all men life and breath and everything. Whether they realize it comes from God or not, whether they know there's a God or not, whether they love and obey God or not, he gives to all men life and breath and everything. He is a God of goodness. James tells us in chapter 1 verse 17 that every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is kind even to those who do not deserve his kindness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. The continuation of life shows his great, great patience. The laws of sowing and reaping suggest to us the goodness of God. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has provided for all of our needs. Nature tells us a lot about God. If we'll just look at it, if we'll just listen, if we'll just be willing to learn. But then that brings up a question. How should we respond to such a great God? How should we react to a God of beauty, a God of power, a God of love? How should we respond to him? Let me suggest three ways. Number one, we should have a firm conviction of his existence, as we've indicated in numerous passages already. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And in the third verse, he writes, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Without faith, verse 6, it is impossible to please him. 
So as we consider the power of God and the wonder of God and the love of God, as we see it revealed to us in the flowers and in the fields and in the firmament, let us remember we have to have a strong belief and trust in his existence. But because that is true, we also, number two, should have a joyful gratitude for our existence. The fact that we exist, the fact that God created us, the blessings that God has given us, Praise to him should know no bounds because of who we are and what God has made of us in his own likeness. Psalm 63, verse 5, My mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. And 63, verse 7, Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. And number three, Because of God's nature, as revealed to us by nature and his word, we should have a willingness to accept our responsibility as stewards. We just sang a few moments ago, this is my father's world. And because that is true, because it is our father's world, we need to take care of it. We must not destroy it. We ought to enjoy it, to protect it and to preserve it as he has entrusted it to us. Because this is true, we must use our abilities for the good of mankind. As Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men. And because all of this is true, we must live in harmony with God's wonderful laws and obey his will to be saved. In the final analysis, it comes down to, will we listen to the evidence that is so plain and so clear in God's written word? Will we listen to the evidence about God that is so plain and so clear in the world that he has created? Or will we be like the one mentioned in Psalm 14? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This morning, if you believe in God and you have not confessed the name of his blessed son, Jesus Christ, accepted him as Lord and Savior, became a New Testament Christian, of course, the opportunity is always extended to those who are ready and willing to confess Jesus as their Lord and their belief in him, to repent of sins, to have those sins washed away in the waters of baptism. If you at this moment, this morning, are subject to that invitation, let us know how we can help as we stand together and sing.
The song before the communion this morning will be number 53, number 53. We'll sing the first, second, and last stanzas. Years I spent in vanity and pride, carrying my words through the fire, knowing that it was for me that I now have Mercy that was great and grace was free, pardon that was multiplied to me. Does everybody have one of the uh, self-contained uh, bread and fruit of the vine cups? If you've never used one, a little tricky. The, uh, the clear tab on the top, pull that and you'll have the bread. And then you pull the other tab and you'll have the fruit of the vine. There's an old adage, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. You won't find those exact words in the Bible, but I think you will find that sentiment expressed there. It serves to remind us that when we judge people, we usually base it upon the more surface things that we see in them and not necessarily what's in their heart. Uh, as one writer once put it, we don't know their reality. That's true. So when our time comes and the Lord calls us home, it's very reassuring to know that you and I will be judged by a merciful yet just God who actually did walk a mile in our shoes. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is not just the Son of God. He came to, he came to earth to be born of a virgin and to become the man of sorrows who is very acquainted with grief. With unsurpassing love for us, he left his home in heaven to live and to die among his creation as flesh and blood. He experienced life as a man, wading through all of the good and the bad of humanity. As a mortal man, Jesus experienced the joy of pleasing his father and teaching his followers. He endured hunger and temptation in a very weakened state by none other than Satan himself. Jesus, Jesus felt righteous anger and disgust at the religious hypocrites who con constantly sought to undermine him and eventually take his life. There was frustration and disappointment with those who lacked the faith and the perseverance to stay with him. Our Savior felt deep compassion for the lost and the downtrodden. 
and sorrow for the ravages of sin and death that he saw all around him. And of course, our Lord and Savior felt the physical and emotional agony at his impending suffering and cruel death on the cross. So yes, Jesus has experienced exactly what it's, lo- what it's like to walk in our shoes, only he did it without succumbing to sin. He knows exactly what it's like to be me. The word of God assures us that through the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb and the grace of God, it will be an incredible and joyous day when the Lord calls his people home. So each first of the day, first day of the week, we surround this table in remembrance of him who died on the cross for our sins. Matthew 26, 26 tells us, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Would you pray with me? Our dearest Heavenly Father, as we surround this table, our minds go back to the cruel cross of Calvary where your son gave up his life to take on all of the sins that we incur and will incur in the future so that we have that hope for eternal salvation and a home in heaven with you. Father, may we take this, may we take the bread in a manner well pleasing to you, representing his body. These things we pray in his blessed name. Amen. you'd bow with me again as we take the fruit of the vine. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your son's great sacrifice for us. There's no way we can repay that debt other than to be obedient servants to you. As we take this fruit of the vine, we're reminded that that represents his blood that flowed from him as he was nailed to the cross with our sins intact. So bad was the sin that Even you, Father, could not look upon your Son. These things we pray in your blessed Son's name. Amen. I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Ray, it's good to have you back preaching to us. Um, it's been a great day. have a few announcements here and some prayer requests. Ken and Bonnie Blackburn are moving to Virginia. Their house is sold and they're ready to go. This, uh, this today will be their last day. I'm going to miss you, brother, sister. They'll be moving into a multi-generational house with their daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter. And to ensure that they don't forget about us, there's an Arizona book in the lobby for you all to sign. Uh, Good news, Pamela Lynch, that's Candace's mother, was baptized in Lake Pleasant last Sunday afternoon. So we're grateful for that. And they're on their way back home or are back home now. We're saddened to know that Frances McCrory passed away July 3rd. Our prayers and condolences are certainly with Darlene and family. And uh, the services for Francis will be this Thursday, July 16th at 10 a.m. here at West Olive. There will be a viewing at 9.30. 
Carolyn Swallows is requesting prayers for her husband. Uh, Gary uh, was in the hospital with blood clots and possible pneumonia. He had surgery yesterday. It went very well, and he is doing much better than they expected. So she's very uh, thankful for that and, and still continues to ask for prayers that he would continue to strengthen. Bonnie Blackburn, before she goes, will have dental work done this week. Karen Christensen had a biopsy on her jaw on June 22nd. They're very thankful to know that the biopsy came back as non-cancerous. Uh, they uh, thank you for all of your prayers uh, on her behalf and now ask for your prayers uh, as she goes to uh, surgery July 23rd to remove that. Fred Moore is now in rehab after falling and breaking his hip. Uh, he asked for no phone calls at the time, for the time being. John and Jonelle Burke have tested positive for COVID-19, and they are at home in quarantine. Diane Owens and Marley Day are also in quarantine, awaiting for the results of Marley's test. John Lynch requests prayers for his uncle James for physical and spiritual strength while he's in the hospital, and the Daly's daughter-in-law, Maria, has tested positive for COVID-19, so we want to pray for her as well. Well, let's go to our, our Father in prayer, and this will be our dismissal prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this precious moment in time that we set aside to come together as a family of brothers and sisters in love, to express our love for each other, and to show you our love through the singing of songs and the lifting up of our praise to you. Father, we're so thankful that we can look up to you as, as our God and our Father, and, and that we have Jesus Christ had led an example for us as our older brother and, and sacrificed himself so that we could call you our Father. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit that helps us to communicate with you and to express our desires and our concerns and our love to you. Father, we're mindful as we gather here this morning to sing songs to you and to learn from your word that there are those who are unable to be here and we pray, Father, for their individual needs, and we know that you know what, what their needs are, and pray, Father, that you would touch their lives in any need that they have and strengthen them. Father, we pray that as their brothers and sisters, we can be a source of comfort and strength as well, and help us, Father, to know how we can reach out to them and, and say the things that they need to hear and, and uh, show the, our love for them. Father, as we go our separate ways this morning, we pray that you would be with us and keep us safe and that you would uh, help us, Father, to always uh, be ready to give an account for the joy that can be found in our lives. Help us, Father, to uh, express that uh, expression that others would see us and know that we've been with you and your son, Jesus Christ, here in this place. Bring us back at the next point of time this evening and be with those, Father, who, who cannot be here with us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.